This year, as we all know, small businesses across the nation suffered due to COVID. But even in normal years, small and independent business owners who lack the political clout and resources of large corporations find themselves at a significant disadvantage, especially when they live in states and operate out of states where politicians value special interests and political connections over a level playing field. Today, I'm putting small business owner Isabella Rubinas and her attorney, Paul Rafelson, in the spotlight. Isabella operates an online business from Glen Ellen, Illinois. She just filed a civil rights lawsuit in the U.S. District Court for the Northern District of Illinois against the State of California Department of Tax and Fee Administration, the state agency that oversees the collection of sales tax and uses taxes. Rubinus is a mother of two young children who operates Lollipop Seeds, an online boutique and Amazon third-party supplier that specializes in clothing for young children. She runs the business from her kitchen table. In December, without warning, CDTFA froze Rubinus' bank account in Illinois in an effort to collect thousands of dollars in taxes on sales that Lollipop Seeds made through Amazon in 2017, 2018, and 2019. The freeze threatens to push lollipop seeds out of business. So Isabel, thank you for being here. Paul, thank you for being here. I'd like to start by you telling us the story of your business and how you got started. And sure. Um, so my business started in um, 2012. Um, I had a brick and mortar in the city. Um, I had two kids, two little kids, and it was my dream. I had always wanted to open up a store. Mm -hmm. So um, we decided to move to the suburbs and kind of took the business with us and started it online. So I own an online business selling kids clothes, baby clothes. Mm -hmm. And so this year you had a couple of double whammies. First COVID hit. Yes. Which for you have designer kids clothing, nobody's dressing up their kids. Correct. Right? Yeah. Correct. So that presents a problem. Yes. And then in December you had, you got hit with um, the, the letter from uh, I got hit California. with a letter from California mm -hmm. that they were seizing my funds um, due to me not paying California sales tax. For, but for 2017, 2018? Yes, right yeah. to, retroactively for mm -hmm. 2017, 18, and 2019. Okay. So your business, how has this impacted your business? Um, well, funds were mm -hmm. seized, so it made it very difficult to yeah. purchase new product to continue mm -hmm. the business. Um, it's... I'm making it work. I'm making it work right now. Yeah. Um, but it has not been easy. Are at you all. still on Amazon or are you? I am on Amazon. Okay. Um, so in 2017, um, I was looking for an additional marketplace okay. because I wasn't getting as many online sales as I wanted to. And so I started selling on Amazon mm -hmm. and sales boomed. It mm -hmm. was just, um, it was just so great to be on Amazon. Um, and so 2018, I continued. I continued for 2019 as well. 2020, when COVID hit, um, I wasn't seen as an essential business. So therefore, Amazon, I didn't qualify for the prime deals anymore. Oh. I wasn't prime shipping anymore. Oh. Um, so people had the, um, people could cancel orders. Mm -hmm. um, it would take up to three weeks to get my product. Um, I wasn't, you know, I wasn't face masks, I wasn't hand sanitizer, I wasn't toilet paper, right. I wasn't any other things that, that people needed. Oh, gosh. So, so that really, so I mean, three that weeks for items is... Destroyed my yeah. business. That oh. really, COVID really, really yeah. damaged me. Um, so sales were down drastically. Mm -hmm. um, and we're still trying to recuperate from that. Uh, so just, and the law is, uh, as far as taxes and Amazon go and sales taxes, there's been a couple in 2011 Amazon and California reached a deal where Amazon did agree that they would collect sales tax and their claim to your tax money is that they have a manufacture a distribution center Correct. in California <laughs> that houses your product but you had no say in that correct you couldn't choose where your product was housed and then they ship from there correct okay. Amazon does tell me where to ship um, my shipments, but once it's there, they can do whatever they want with it. So, so that's how California is involved, right? And so then in 2011, Amazon and California reached this deal where Amazon would start collecting sales tax um, unless there was some sort of federal, 
federal legislation that required all internet sellers to collect taxes. I don't know, you know, how much Wayfair v. South Dakota, the Supreme Court ruling, impacted that deal. Um, but it said that online retailers that meet a minimum sales threshold are required to pay taxes. But in 2019. Gavin Newsom, the California governor, signed a bill that set out of state businesses, which would be you, that make less than $5,000 per year, which also would be you, me. won't have to collect sales taxes from online purchases. So, Paul, to you, yes. California, their reason for doing this, or why? what is their claim to her sales taxes retroactively? Right, so I think you're, you're putting a great timeline together. So right in 2011, um, around that time, Amazon agreed after essentially, you know, going back and forth, the legislature basically threatened to impose a tax obligation on Amazon anyway, to collect tax on their sales in California. The problem was the way the, the understanding, not the law, was that that would only apply to what makes up today less than half of Amazon sales. These are sales that are not uh, fulfilled through, uh, you know, supplied by third-party merchants by like Isabel, but they're the sales of products that Amazon they, themselves sources, sort of the 1P versus 3P, oftentimes indistinguishable to the customer. They can be in the same shopping cart. They can be prime. You may not even know. A lot of times customers don't even know what is 1P versus 3P. Mm -hmm. um, because Amazon really doesn't want you to know who you're buying from because then mm -hmm. you might go to them and get a cheaper price on their website, right? Like, so there, right. there's a reason why Amazon does it this way. Right. Um, and so from 2011 to 2019, uh, Amazon's position and the state of California sort of agreed was that each individual merchant like Isabel had to collect their own sales tax on Amazon sales to Amazon's customers in California. Mm -hmm. And if you didn't know to opt in and push the button and register your business in California, uh, you wouldn't have known. And you also, um, whether you had an obligation to, they would sometimes tie to that Wayfair decision. But this was all really a farce. I mean, at the end mm -hmm. of the day, it wasn't really how the law worked. In 2019, it became official that Amazon, eBay, and other marketplaces, uh, Etsy, Poshmark, uh, all had to collect tax uh, as of October 1st, 2019, this is a bill. Actually, I was involved in the lobbying. I was, you see me testifying in old videos for the committee on why they needed to, to push this change, whether through legislation or just through, uh, you know, interpretation of the law, which, uh, you know, we'll get to, but, mm -hmm. uh, that's basically what happened was so in 2019, so between 20, 2011, and 2019, most small merchants who were sort of lured into Amazon and didn't really know what they were, you know, what, what was going on. They thought, okay, well, my, my CPA says I need to collect sales tax in my state. Cause you know, prior to Wayfair, we had this case called the Quill case from 1992. And that mm -hmm. says I have to be physically present. I live in Illinois. So I'm going to collect Illinois tax through Amazon. That's, right. that's what I'm going to do. And then flash forward, 2018, 2019, California finally starts telling sellers, well, it is our interpretation that, because your inventory ended up in California by Amazon or you know at Amazon's direction, you should have been collecting taxes in some cases all the way back to 2012. So we've got clients who and, oh my and members of our online merchants guild we're getting oh my you know God. six seven figure assessments right that they have to protest for taxes wow. right uh, and this is just one state right so mm -hmm. then there's, you've also got Washington, Wisconsin, Massachusetts, now Pennsylvania. More and more states are looking for this old revenue that they're actually not even entitled to because it violates certain legal right. constitutional provisions and, and federal law and state law. Um, and Paul, that looking... wouldn't have anything to do with the fact that they shut down their state's economies and then also as you know, people are fleeing, taxpayers are leaving the state, these states. That, no, I that... mean, in some ways, yes. Like, I think that's where Pennsylvania, who we recently sued, may yeah. be going because they are in, in dire straits. But but in some cases, like California, Massachusetts, Washington State, this sort of reign of terror against small businesses who are all out of state, politically it's weak, ongoing. right? Yeah. Has been going on for years. Yeah. So these states have been, un, you know, violating the civil rights of these small merchants who have mm -hmm. no constitutional connection to these states. Nor and there's and it's it's really scary. It's really scary to see. But because they're small and because they're defenseless and they certainly mm -hmm. can't afford to litigate tax cases in these states, these states see it as an opportunity. It's like you know, it's a free for all against small business at the state level, and it's all 
being coordinated in part by an organization called the Multi-State Tax Commission, mm-hmm. which doesn't really go in our case, but just so people understand, like this, these are coordinated efforts. States have a an organization where they they get together and they talk at conferences, maybe like you do it in your in your line of work, and they develop these strategies. How are we going to go out and get these people? Yeah. And they literally had a representative go to an Amazon conference and tell everybody in the audience that you're all tax cheats and you're going to owe all this money for back taxes. And it, it's it's really an insane world out there if you're a small e-commerce business. Insane. No, I mean, you're, it, it really you are is. especially vulnerable as a small business. Uh, Illinois has a lot of similar rules and regulations on small businesses, but we'll get to that in a minute. But so y- y- the lawsuit you filed, uh, Isabella, mm-hmm. on behalf of or against the state of California, what is that? What's the claim that you're making? So that lawsuit we filed on behalf of Isabella is similar to another lawsuit that we filed in Sacramento, but it's really it's really sort of an added element about sovereignty. It's about, you know, Isabella is an Illinois resident with no minimum connection to the state of Illinois. Mm-hmm. There was also a federal law that was passed in 1999. It was continually renewed until made permanent just a few years ago mm-hmm. called the Internet Tax Freedom Act. And what that law says is that the way you tax retailers in the brick and mortar mm-hmm. level has to be the same in e-commerce. Mm-hmm. So in other words, you know, you can't, if, if the way you tax Home Depot is, Home Depot collects sales tax at the point of sale, you can't go to a hardware store website and say, well, we're not gonna tax the website, we're gonna tax the supplier, which is effectively what Amazon sellers are when they mm-hmm. deal with Amazon. They are the supplier of Amazon. They are what we call upstream economically. So you wouldn't go to Black & Decker for supplying Lowe's.com right? Say Black & Decker, you owe the sales tax on low sales. And that's sort of the underlying point. Amazon is a retailer, whether it's Isabel sales, whether it's their own products or Isabel's products, they all come through the Amazon shopping cart. Only the Amazon credit card can be offered as an incentive. Only the Amazon return policy controls. Isabel doesn't control any of those things. She is no different than a supplier of a brick and mortar retail store, mm-hmm. right? But she's supplying Amazon store. But Amazon has politically maneuvered in what I would say is probably the most uh, impressive tax avoidance uh, scheme in history sure. to basically and, and politically mot- using the political benefits of here, look how many jobs we're going to let you say you brought in a state to sort of get states to look the other way. And the reason why the Amazon wants to do that is because they want they want to sell stuff tax free, which they couldn't do in California and other states as mm-hmm. of like 2011 in the case of California because they made this deal. So what they did was they pushed more consumers into the marketplace and made the marketplace almost identical to its own stuff. That's why people like Isabel can be prime and you don't even know that that's right. Isabel's products that were not supplied by, you know, somebody else or mm-hmm. Amazon's uh, suppliers. Um, and, and that way they can use marketplace as a way to continue the tax avoidance that allows them to charge lower prices. So really who the politicians are, are, are doing a disservice to in exchange for these Amazon jobs, this is important for people to understand are the local business owners in the states and obviously the population, right? Like the tax losses are monumental. I mean, on a state level, on a, at a multi-state level in the aggregate, this is pales in comparison to any of the biggest IRS tax dodge cases. You know, you're talking hundreds of billions of dollars in lost tax revenue to the states over the span of a decade. And you're talking about a real anti-competitive spin on tax uh, tax incentives, which which really is, this is not like a tax incentive. This is a anti-competitive price advantage. Amazon wanted to be the duty-free store in the States while its local competitors couldn't. So if you were a small business owner, like my client, Stan Gross in, in, in Fresno, who, who filed a lawsuit to try to recover those taxes because he was sold out by his government, mm-hmm. right? When they said, Stan, your camera store has to collect sales tax from its consumers, but Amazon does not. So people will go into your store and as long as those sales occur on the marketplace, you know, which is again identical, you're going to be at an economic disadvantage because you're going to have to charge 10% more on camera equipment than Amazon. So um, it's really it's 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 hard to unpack. Uh, a really, it's not a brilliant tax avoidance scheme. It's just you have to be as big as Amazon to even think about trying it because it's it's so absurd that you would never think. It, it, I sort of say it's sort of like. You know, imagine walking into your local Home Depot and not paying sales tax on a you know, Black & Decker uh, electronic screwdriver and, and being curious. You ask the 
person at Home Depot, why am I not paying sales tax on this? I'm, I'm here, I'm in the store, I'm buying it. And they say, oh, well, you know, we're going to say that, you know, our contract with uh, Black & Decker says they're the seller and our store, Home Depot, is just facilitating your sale on, on behalf of Black & Decker. So we yeah. don't have to collect sales tax. Now, I know the Illinois Department of Revenue really well. They would never, ever let any company get away with it. But Amazon's special and mm-hmm. this cost people a yes. ton. As he... I mean, what you're describing is truly a David versus Goliath effort. What was your decision making process in this? Because it's, you know, you could be like, a lot of people would be like, you know what, it's $2,000. I can't take on the governor of California and Amazon as, you know, I'm just a mom. What was your decision making process in filing this lawsuit? You know, we had actually... um the money we got the letter and then the money was taken out uh christmas eve yeah. so it was just a really really rough time sure. um and when we received the letter from the states of california mm-hmm. we just there i felt like there had to be something mm-hmm. that could be done mm-hmm. um and so i found the online merchants guild mm-hmm. and um you know paul has helped and it, it's just been he's been such a like a breath of fresh air showing me that, you know, this isn't my fault. This isn't something that happens. Right. Because the state of California, I, so I knew that I owed taxes. I had, state of California reached out to me. And because it's the government, you're you're going to do what the government's telling you, right? So I filled out um, all the information they requested. They took that and turned around and said, okay, now you owe us this much in taxes. So it was just really, I knew that it was, coming but we had because of COVID and everything Mm -hmm. um, we just had kind of a a space in communications Mm -hmm. and then without any warning this letter came Mm -hmm. and it was just like there's got to be something to be done I cannot be the only one that they're coming after and so I found Paul in the Online Merchant Guild and they you know like I said breath of fresh air and just kind of helped me see that um, I didn't do anything wrong yeah have there been any other small business owners who want to become a party to this lawsuit out of Illinois? or have is You there know, there, there's a lot of small business owners who are a member of, you know, the Online Merchant Skills is yeah. a nonprofit trade association. I help mm-hmm. start for Amazon sellers. I do this purely as a volunteer, mm-hmm. you know, in terms of I don't I don't get a, any salary from, from the Online Merchant Skills or any type mm-hmm. of, you know, remuneration from the guild, you know. Um, I just do this because, again, as a law professor who teaches a constitutional law class on taxation at the state and local level, as somebody who's been a tax litigator in addition to other you know, areas of law for big corporations, I've never seen anything like this. I've never seen such an abuse of power mm-hmm. and such just like political corruption drive something to where a person like Isabel could be in the situation she's in when she's actually, you know, her civil rights are being violated. I mean, it's, it's not the traditional civil rights, her, thing, but it, just- it constitutes a civil rights violation. She lives in the state of Illinois. She is not connected to California. There is no precedent out there in the federal courts. And it's very hard to do this. And this is why I like this bill's case is because we're trying and it's going to be very mm-hmm. difficult because, um, but we're trying to establish a precedent here that look, when you're, we live in a world now where if you're in e-commerce, you're one, you have instant access to the national economy. You're supposed to be protected from these undue burdens that these states are putting onto you. But we also live in a world where a state can simply lob they can literally get your data from a service provider like Amazon, lob out a million notices saying you owe a bunch of money. And you're yeah. totally without recourse right now. Can you, you're literally under the current law, the way mm-hmm. people interpret the current law, they expect you to pay those taxes and sue for a refund. You don't have, there's no due process there, right? right. No, because it's right. Based, based on an old law that had to do with the railroads using the federal courts. We're trying to say, look, in cases like Isabel, where you've got these clear cut, constitutional violations, she should have the right to seek sanctuary in her home jurisdiction. She is at home in Illinois. She does not belong in California. So that made her case really special mm -hmm. because her case really highlighted that, that like Mm -hmm. she's at home here. She should be able to get sanctuary. The protections of federal law that exist should work in real time to protect her in this environment where states are completely out of their minds. They're completely uh, beholden to Amazon and will basically do anything other than hold Amazon accountable for the taxes that they avoided, which, and they're basically taking those taxes and trying to pin them on Isabel and over a million similarly situated merchants in the U S granted, there's probably another 2 million similar situation merchants in countries outside of the United States, which the States have no chance of ever recovering from those people. 
But that that's beside the point because Amazon sellers in this in the United States are from all over the world. Sure. But they're picking on the American small business. The 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 the, the women owned business movement mm-hmm. has has been fueled by Amazon. The minority mm-hmm. business w- movement, the immigration owned business has been uh, immigrant owned. Excuse me, business movement has been fueled by these platforms. And rather than celebrating it, we're crushing these people's lives. Like these yeah. states are just destroying because they don't know. They don't care. It's not their, it's not their women owned businesses in their mind, right? Like California is not going after California businesses. They're only going after Illinois. Illinois businesses. So So who cares? Speaking of that, has Kwame Raul reached out to you at all, uh, Illinois Attorney General? Has he offered to intervene here? We actually tried to make contact with the Illinois AG. We had a few contacts that we reached out to, just kind of completely silent. We were re- and really that's disappointing because really a case like this belongs in the hands of the AG. Yeah. A state AG should look at this as an invasion of their sovereignty, that Illinois businesses are being under attack by Gavin Newsom, who's trying to bring his policies, his tax policies, his anti-business policies to other states. You I know, would say California. this is an absolute failure of the AG's office. If there are thousands of retailers in Illinois who so are facing un- uh, almost uh, the victim of a predatory law by another state, we uh, spoke with we spoke with, Repu- with with Representative Kasten. We've got members of his district. Um, we've got Illinois members testifying to Congress. We actually a number of us like we met. We had we had a whole hearing with Congress. Nobody is doing anything about any this. Illinois this is congressman. Your congressman is Sean Kasten. Did mm-hmm. Sean Kasten reach out to you? Has he done Not anything? Not to me. Not we to tried. Me. He didn't you call, reach you tried out to reach out to Sean Kasten and he didn't reach out to you. No, and I spoke to him earlier. And he's a business you know, guy. He's before, supposed to be a business guy. Not, no, nothing. I mean, mm-hmm. nobody, nobody seems to care. And that's what concerns me again, because as a law professor, yeah. I look at this, and it's just like, I mean, this is a very personal, like, yeah. because I know this law, it's like, I just, I, I, you can tell I'm very heated about the issue, because it's like, I can't believe this is happening in America. Like, this is, this is insanity. Um, and, and, and the road forward does not look better. It looks worse, right? Well, as states look for more ways to impose now income, you know, soon small business like Isabel, you'll have to file income tax returns yeah. in all 50 states. I mean, even any idea how expensive that would be, it would cost her more. She, she'd spend a thousand dollars to tell Pennsylvania she owes him $38 and 42 cents. I mean, that's, and imagine doing that it's 50 so times. I mean, it's, it's, right. it's just insanity what the states are doing because mm-hmm. they, they, there's no, nobody is reining them in at the federal level. The AGs are all afraid to do anything because they think, well, we may, maybe we want to go after the people in other states, right? That's zero right. sum game of just going after small businesses. Well, and, and Illinois doesn't want to upset Amazon because Illinois cannot afford to lose. I mean, they courted Amazon. They were offering special deals to bring them to Chicago, and Amazon didn't take it because Chicago in Illinois is not a great place to do business. They managed to bring fulfillment centers here in 2020 in the south suburbs. Um, but that was a special deals. I don't know that it was, sales it was probably tax, the same special deal that they were offering taxes. for the headquarters. So that's why you do. I, I used I was involved in a major headquarters move for yeah. another large corporation in my life. And, you know, that's why you do the way Amazon does mm-hmm. it. You do it to see, OK, what's their best and final offer on headquarters? And you say, well, you know, here's a consolation prize. Will you give us the same thing, even though it's not a headquarters? And usually it's, you know, it's negotiated. But. You know, exactly. And, and I'll tell you a story, a conversation we had with some some folks, the Wisconsin Department of Revenue that I think Illinoisans will find interesting. You know, in 2015, uh, Wisconsin actually looked at the Amazon transaction sort of the same way the other states did and actually concluded that Amazon should have been collecting tax. They said, you know, you mm-hmm. really need to be collecting tax on all of it, not just right. half of it. Right. Because you're you're the seller. You're you're the one making the sale. You're the one who's transferring physical custody of the goods to the customer and all these things. Um, Amazon told Wisconsin flat out, if you make us do that, we're going to bring all of the distribution centers we put in, I think it's Kenosha, we're going to put them in Illinois. We're going to go talk to Illinois. Yeah, so of course Illinois that freaked out Wisconsin. So, yeah. mm-hmm. I mean, we're that's desperate. so anti-competitive yeah. what, what's right. going on it, because it's just so different than any other tax because mm-hmm. it's, it's a tax the consumer is meant to pay. Amazon's not supposed to pay these taxes. They're just supposed to collect it from the consumer. Right. But when you exempt Amazon from the obligation to collect, it becomes an anti-competitive, ta- uh, you know, like if you, if, 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 if companies did this in other countries, this would be a foreign corrupt practices act violation, like hands down. It's amazing. And I, I still think it's, it's, it runs afoul of a number of federal laws, but yet nobody's paying attention. Justice, I mean, nobody, everyone's afraid of Amazon and just wants to be Amazon's sure. friend. 
And um, the people who should stand up to them, like Kwame Raul, on behalf of uh, Isabel and other employees, are just they're just rolling over because we don't want to make Amazon mad. I mean, it's just no, how do just you let them, Yeah, just let other it's states, you so know. And, and there's tragic, a way, you know, he could come in and say, look, Kwame, like, he could come in and say, look, I'm mum as to whether Amazon should owe this tax, mm -hmm. even though he should actually go after Amazon for the billions in taxes that they avoided in Illinois. Right. Because they do owe the state of Illinois a massive amount of money. Mm -hmm. But, but you know, and, and what is normally the most aggressive Department of Revenue that I've personally been up against, for some reason with Amazon, Amazon's like the, like, is like, it's like watching a zombie movie, like what's the walking dead or something. And then you have like this one person that's like, you know, magically not, you know, interesting to zombies. Right. That's <laughs> Amazon in the department of revenues. Act, Correct. Right? In Illinois you don't and see anything. State. What's a, what? Yeah. It's like, yeah. there's no blood. I don't know. It looks, it looks okay to me. Mm -hmm. But he could have come in and said, at least the very least, he could have said, you're not California. You're not going to come in and impose your laws. On on businesses that have no connection. Yeah. There's a sovereignty issue here. And that's yeah. kind of why we went to federal court. That's why we sued California in Illinois. California has tax offices in Chicago. There are tax auditors who work for the state of California living and working in the city of Chicago. So they are in Illinois going after businesses all day long. But they're meant to be going after Boeing and other big right. corporations that are multinational, not Isabel, right? Right. So we <laughs> we sued them and, and and we sued California in a federal court in Illinois mm -hmm. to make the point that like she should have there, there's a sovereignty problem here. They are violating federal sovereignty laws, right? Like they, like they're not supposed to be able to do that uh, by going after Isabel and other similarly situated merchants in the state of Illinois, whose only connection to the state, which isn't really a connection at all, is through the Amazon FBA program. That's not a connection. That's not enough. And, uh, and, you know, at the very least, he could have come in and, 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 you know, intervened in the matter and come to Isabel's defense. But I mean, I, 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 I'm, I've become very cynical the last few years, just watching this whole thing yeah. unfold and, and yeah. I have no doubt that that would never happen. But, you know, we tried, I, I'm definitely gonna say we tried. I can send no. and show you the emails. We send I'm not emails. surprised either, but I think that you should not stop talking about this and the fact that these people who are supposed to stand up for you completely failed. I think that you have, I mean, yes, you have a leadership problem, right? There's a leadership problem in California and there's a leadership problem in Illinois. Um, and until we wake up to that, this, I don't see, I don't see this. I mean, it's going to have to be litigated, but it's going to take... I, I, what, how far are you prepared to go with this lawsuit? I, I, what do you we're, expect? We're take, we're, oh, go ahead, Isabel. I mean, uh, I mean, we're we're taking it as far as we can take it. Mm -hmm. You know, what do you, what do you hope happens? I I mean, my hope is that you know they 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 leave Illinois businesses alone. Mm -hmm. They leave businesses alone that do not belong to the state of California right. because it's not it's not fair. Mm -hmm. It's double dipping. It's um, it's just it blows my mind that yeah. this is even a possibility yeah. that you we're even a, having a level this. playing field. Right. right. You don't right. I mean, you're happy for Amazon to be operating, but you just want the same opportunities and not to have your assets seized by another state's government. Correct. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, I mean, keep in mind, right? As of today, Amazon collects its tax, so it's like there is a level playing field there. It mm -hmm. took them long enough. I mean, I wrote a Supreme Court brief in Wayfair on behalf of online merchants, like explaining like there was no reason why that could have happened ten years ago. Amazon was operating in in these states. Um, they had affiliates in these states. They have, you know, there there where there was enough case law that would have put Amazon squarely within just about every state in the country. 10 years ago, even the ones they weren't physically in, in the same way that like, you know, having a warehouse, but they had other connections. Like I, I assure you there were Amazon employees doing business in Chicago long before the first warehouse was ever here. And, and the Wayfair matter didn't even matter, but right. this was, this was about, it's just, it is really scary. And uh, that we're just like in this world where it's like, we're small businesses, like everyone, every politician mm -hmm. loves to, loves to say that they're out How for small, small businesses, businesses, but they yeah. don't actually care. They don't care. They don't care. No. And we can, and we, we, and you know, as, as an organization, like I'm a lawyer, I like what I do. I do. I, I understand what I do. I'm not a PR person. I'm not uh -huh. a person who can really like raise that awareness to the people. Like you've been, you know, if you're a small business owner who was competing against Amazon, you've been robbed. If you're mm -hmm. a resident of a state, like 
every school in America should have a STEM lab, like state of the art, like STEM lab based on the amount of money that was lost across the states. It's an astronomical amount of money that people were. And because it was all off the books, hush, hush. Every time we've tried to file like public records requests, we always get denied. This is some sort of private, you know, when you when you do incentives, they're supposed to be public record. But of course, these are all sort of, you know, off the books agreements. And, and it's just completely like, I mean, the reason why it's, it, it's not only the largest tax evasion scheme in history, it's actually like it couldn't have worked without the cooperation of state state government officials yeah. who are in the know. So mm -hmm. sometimes I suspect the reason why that we don't get that is because there's an element of we don't want to expose what we did back in the day uh -huh. and kind of shine a light on it. Now, one state, South things. Carolina, mm -hmm. they made a crappy deal with Amazon, pardon my language. They made a terrible deal with Amazon, but they made it for five years. And mm -hmm. after five years, they said, you're collecting tax on everything. Amazon said, no, no, no. We, we said we'd only collect tax on our own sales, not marketplace. Right. They sued Amazon. And, and in like a 60 page opinion, the South Carolina tax court was like, mm -hmm. you owe this tax Amazon. This is the most ridiculous thing I've ever seen. You literally said your tax evasion plan is like would be like Target saying we don't have to collect tax because our cash registers in a different company than our store. He's mm -hmm. like, that's absurd. And so it is here. I mean, it's this. like any court that actually examines this case in the merits. Mm -hmm. Our problem being in federal court, you know, is that for us to for us to get in on the merits, we have to first convince the federal courts that they should hear this case. And, and that's part of that. That's that's part of why we're doing it. This is a harder road than you know paying the tax and suing for a refund, which could take years, um, which is what they want you to do. Because we're really trying to establish some precedent here that like when a person like Isabel mm -hmm. is wrongly accused of tax avoidance by a state that she has no connection to, she should have some level of protection in her home. A federal court in her jurisdiction should be able to say, "Hold on here, get the heck out of here, yeah. you other state," because she has no connection. And you un understood going in that this was going to be a long road and you were going yes. to be an advocate for a while. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. And you were prepared for that. Yes, Has I there am. been any repercussions? Has anybody come after you? No, no, no repercussions. Okay. No, it's okay. been um, actually a lot of people are on my on side. side. Yeah. Okay, good, good. Um, are there other cases, other small businesses who are filing similar lawsuits? So we don't typically file, I mean, we don't typically what we'll do is because, because the online merchant school is a trade association, mm -hmm. it can basically stand in the shoes of a collective of small business. So our members, okay. right? So to be a member of online merchant skilled, all we ask is, you know, we have suggested contributions, but all we actually ask is people make a hundred dollar contribution a year. Like that's our minimum contribution to be a member. We, we, we just say like, you know, if you're, if you're making, if you're one of the fortunate ones who can actually make like, you know, 10 million on Amazon, we might ask you to do more to support our, our, our litigation efforts, our lobbying efforts and other advocacy efforts, you know, we were the number one cited resource in the antitrust report, because we're not just trying to fight the government, we're also trying to fight with Amazon, like we're trying to level that playing field between Amazon mm -hmm. and how it mistreats the third party merchants, again, because the government doesn't want to do anything about it, right? Like that antitrust right. hearing with respect to Amazon, it's the, nobody's doing anything about it, because nobody, nobody wants to, everybody's afraid to do anything with Amazon, no problem with Facebook, no problem with Google. But Amazon, it's like, you know, so we're trying to level that playing field. So we were, of course, very vocal with the antitrust uh, investigation. And uh, so we're out there as an advocacy group trying to uh, trying to basically be a voice for the sellers. And part of the problem is we're trying to teach small businesses that aren't familiar with trade associations, like how powerful that can be. There are mm -hmm. over a million Amazon sellers in the country. If we could capture even just a, a small percentage of them, it's like we could be one of a very powerful organization that could really have a voice, but we're just not there yet. So, right. um, but we're constantly, yeah, we have lawsuits, but we can, when we file a lawsuit, we can file it on behalf of our members. So that way mm -hmm. people don't have to put their own self out there. Isabel is very this brave is and, and just was an amazing, inspiring uh, person with an amazing, inspiring story. Um, and and just really just wanted to do this and, and highlight sort of, because I think sometimes when you file as an organization, this, the people like Isabel get lost though. That's the downside, right? Yeah. Like the people who are in Isabel's shoes, mm -hmm. like the government, like the, they don't necessarily see you in that way. They just see, Oh, organization. Right. You know um, the importance of this case, I think was we really wanted to show like, like this is a person who under no circumstances should have anything to do with a California law rule, regulation, right. tax, whatever. None of that should be applying to her. She should not be penalized for what goes on, you know, thousand miles 
did not you're in Illinois, right? Like mm-hmm. 2000 miles away. Yeah. Um, Thousands of miles. <laughs> yeah. They're like, yeah. yeah, more than, yeah. Right. Yeah. Very far away. Mm-hmm. Um, she has nothing to do with it. And so I just thought, you know, we thought it was just a really, you know, eye opening case of, you know, trying to show people like what is going on and why For we sure. need that you know, states should be protecting their sovereign. I mean, the states should care. These are their own business. You know, if California yeah. drains every Illinois Amazon merchant and there's like, I forget, like 30, 40,000 of them, probably, probably more now, right, of their money, it's like, that's bad for Illinois. You should care. Uh, Illinois citizens are under attack. You should care, right. right? But they don't. So we're just trying to, but we're trying to show people like, this is the real story here. These are not, Good. Good. you know, this is not mm-hmm. the same as, you know, suing Google, right? Like we don't, we're not, mm-hmm. nobody's sympathetic to Google. If Google has to pay $5 million in taxes because Illinois says Google owes $5 million. They're going to be just fine paying those $5 right. million and suing for a refund in a lawsuit that could cost hundreds of thousands. Yeah, Isabel it's all, it's could never game. file yeah. a lawsuit for hundreds of thousands. So we're trying mm-hmm. to explain to the court that there needs to be a quick and easy like layer of protection for somebody who's caught up in this because now it's too easy for the states to just lob these Mm-hmm. tax bills at anybody. And it's not just Amazon, right? It could be, you know, you could be doing, you could be a small business owner in Illinois and maybe you go on Fiverr to have somebody help you design a logo, right? Like one sure. of those websites, mm-hmm. right? And maybe you go on Fiverr and somebody, some creative type in California says, oh, here, I'll be designing a logo. Next thing you know, you have California going after you for having a California employee or an ABC employee. Right. I mean, like, Where does it stop? Mm-hmm. Where does it end? Mm-hmm. And 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 the thing about it is you say, oh, that's ridiculous, right? But this is what no, states do in tax world. Like this is what mm-hmm. they do to big corporations that they're now doing to small businesses. They just make it up. They don't care if they're right or wrong. They know they're wrong against Isabel. They right. know that but they who's going to argue in the law. But yeah. Who's gonna, yeah, are you going to yeah. go to court in California? Right. Yeah. No. Well, I hope so, they met their match in here. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. We, I mean, we have to do something because it is like, it is literally... Like, I sound like a crazy person, but it's like, when you look at no. it from the eyes of somebody who like really said, this is tyranny. This is like the, Absolutely. this is the very tyranny. That's the foundation of our you country, right? Like we were founded yep. on like, mm-hmm. not like tax tyranny was something we really opposed at the very beginning of our country, right? I think we threw mm-hmm. a bunch of tea in a, in a harbor somewhere. I can't remember what that was called, but uh, you know, <laughs> yeah, right. taxes. Uh, it, this is like way worse because now it's like, it's, it's like, it's, it's not happening from a foreign, it's happening like, in our own house like our states are just like you know just yeah. totally out of control and nobody's reeling them in and and if anything it seems like everyone's more sympathetic to the states not having money you know what any state that says they don't have money right now go look at the south carolina lawsuit against amazon and go to amazon for the tens of billions they owe your state just leave isabel alone that's our message right. just leave her out of it she had nothing to do with it yeah so so Sorry, very, the, very no, that's no, it's really great. Um, so the lawsuit is filed. What are the next steps? What comes so next for you? We just finished a briefing uh, uh, a few a uh, few days ago. I think it was last week sometime. We finished a briefing. So I mean, you know, we are trying to move this case along fast, and the judge recognizes that. So um, I think he's struggling with the jurisdictional question of whether a federal court can intervene in this kind of a state tax matter, because again, the default rule is they not, you know, state courts are not, federal courts are not supposed to intervene in state tax matters. We're like, judge, this is very different. Um, you know, we got the impression first early on that he's not ready to agree with us that it's different, but that's okay. Um, but then that means that we go up to, um, where are we here? Seventh circuit, uh, where is I want to shoot? I'm losing my mind. I'm telling you so many things go on different circuits right now. So we go up to the appellate courts. If we don't, you know, if we don't get our, if we don't get, you know, the, the preliminary injunction, which is basically saying judge tell California to leave, leave her alone. Mm-hmm. Uh, if we don't get that, then we go up. Um, most likely what the court's going to say is, you know, and it's kind of what the judge said in his first initial ruling where he asked, you know, on, on what we call a temporary restraining order, but now we're at the preliminary injunction phase. You know, the thing with a temporary restraining order is you're asking the judge to make a quick decision. So you kind of say respectfully say, well, OK, maybe not that urgent. Right. Where like nobody's nobody's pulling a plug here. So maybe that's a little too urgent. But sometimes you just need to do that to get the ball rolling. Um, but in this case where we're now at a preliminary injunction. So we're saying, you know, we're asking the court to basically say, stop, you know, California, stop doing this to people who are just using Amazon. Um, you know, it, it may be, you know 
I don't know. I mean, you mm-hmm. may stick with his initial reaction, which was this looks pretty wrong, but because we're a federal court, we can't assume jurisdiction over it. But, you know, he, he did note that it didn't look right. You know, uh, it's, it's also retroactive. We always say like, you know, people say ignorance of the law is no excuse. And like to a mm-hmm. point that's true. But if that were really true, then it's like, why would, why do we have speed limit signs? Because an interstate in an interstate environment that we are in, like we need speed limit signs, right? Mm-hmm. Like you're not, you don't pull over in every town and go to their hall of records and look up the speed limits for the roads. You're supposed to, that certain things are supposed, certain information is supposed to be given to you in real time. Well, and um, actually your Congressman Sean Kasten, who's not responding to you on this, stood up on a financial disclosure thing that said you can't hold certain, I believe it was small businesses, maybe it was individuals, to some of the standards that exist in financial laws because the way it's written is too obscure they don't um you can't so you can't hold them to those rules because they can't understand the language in what's written but he's not standing up on this because it's amazon i mean so i don't know i mean i don't know if that's what it is but it's like it is weird you seem to have interest about a year ago but um it just like you just like don't totally like you know and sometimes it's i don't i mean the age, you know, sometimes it's the age, you know, the aides are all, you know, 12 years old and have no idea and just think, you know, they think they know what's important. And really just, it's really obnoxious. Because when I talk to congressional aides, I just want to vomit. They literally, you know, they're, they're focused on something totally different. Like, yeah. you know, whatever like the latest. Being somebody on Capitol. And they have no yeah. idea how important this is that this represents right. income independence. That like a lot of our members, they would be, you know, they would be deriving income from the government, right? They would have no opportunity, right? We have, we have mm-hmm. people in like Western Kentucky making, you know, really good living for Western Kentucky, right? Like in Western Kentucky, unless you work for a coal company, like you're, you're, you may make $12 an hour at best, but like our, our, our members are making like $70,000 a year mm-hmm. and they don't have to live in a big city. It's like, it's a really beautiful thing what e-commerce has done. It's liberated us from having to live, you know, being tethered to big cities, it's, it's really giving us this true freedom to operate from anywhere. There was a woman in Hawaii who did a whole thing about how after her house was burned down by a volcano, she could still run her her business on Amazon from a coffee shop somewhere else. Like, it's really cool. Yeah, you've created the first opportunities, time in, yeah, but yes. The first time in history, Americans have a portal to the national economy mm-hmm. that was like, it was like never meant to happen. Like we have the same opportunity as the large corporations to get our products out there. We don't need Shark Tank. We can literally just take our own products and ideas straight to the market mm-hmm. and let the market judge. It's a beautiful thing. It's why we have so many successes. It's why so many of my clients, when I'm not doing the advocacy side, are actually selling their businesses and, and having great uh, exits right now. It's a, it's a really wonderful time. And yet it's like, you know, yeah, you can't hold them to the same standard as Google or or, or Target or Walmart because they're mm-hmm. not. And so and it's it's just it's it's fascinating though. But at the state level, like that, just they don't care. They don't. They just do not care. And and so your point about what you said about the financial regulations is absolutely right. It's like we can't in this environment. You know, we live in such an yeah, overregulated world, and I don't like, mean that like in a, Target could in a to partisan in way. I'm just saying it, right. but like the regulations are really hard because they mm-hmm. were designed for a time when only big corporations were multi-state mm-hmm. in that way. Like could be now I could instantly touch 50 States by shipping one box to Amazon. I can instantly be, have be theoretically be touching 50 States whether I'm doing business there. And so the, the, the way regulations work in this new environment, you know, what we always say it's like with price gouging when we sue to invalidate certain price gouging laws that were being applied to Amazon, because I don't know if you know this, but, a lot of Amazon sellers were being accused of price gouging. Many weren't. I mean, by virtue of selling on Amazon, you're above 10%. So you're, you're technically, you know, uh, presumptively price gouging just because just for making it for Amazon. But here's the funny thing. The number one price gouger during COVID was Amazon itself, not mm-hmm. the merchants. Do you know how many states investigated Amazon? No. Zero. Mm-hmm. Zero. Mm-hmm. And so we went to court on behalf of our merchants in Kentucky and we said, this is an unconstitutional law because the price I set you know, sitting in Kentucky is not a price for Kentucky residents, it's a price for the entire nation. And every state's law is different. So how do we, we can't set state prices, only Amazon can control that. So why don't you just go regulate Amazon and then you don't have to worry about price gouging. You know, like, and that way we don't have to worry about it as small businesses figuring out not only what the price gouging laws are in our state, but also 49 other states uh, potentially. And uh, of course the states resist. No, Amazon's our partner in price gouging. We've never, you know, they're so, you know, they turned in all their merchants. Of course they did. They scapegoat right. merchants. That's what Amazon does. They scapegoat their merchants. Sorry, 
I like to rant. I apologize. No, that's it. This is really an interesting case, and I think you all deserve a really a, a big platform, um, which might, might bigger than this one. Um, but I want to give you the last word. Sure. What do you want people to know um, about? why you did this in this effort, what, or what do you want other small businesses to know about this experience coming away from it? Well, you know, it's been, it's just been really eye-opening. Yeah. Um, when you start a small business, you, you know the laws, you know, at least in my case, mm -hmm. I knew the laws that pertain to Illinois, sure. opening up a small business, sure. and then, you know, getting out there, you are, mm -hmm. you're, um, other states can come after you. and. Mm -hmm. That uh, until it was, you know, last year, I had no idea. Right. So. So and so people should know that this is, you know, th these laws are really hurting. Yeah, these laws yeah. are not OK. They're they're not. It's okay. it's been really it's been really difficult, but we're we're doing the best that we can and trying to keep our head above water. Well, I thank you both for your courage and your time and your advocacy on this. Um, I will I would love you know, to stay in touch with both of you and see how this is going and maybe talk with you again sometime. Um, let us know how of course. what's going on, okay? Um, we appreciate you. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Thank you. Tell our story I, a little bit, you know, and like a lot actually, but it's just, it's such a crazy story. It's so hard to get it all out there. You it, know? it is. A lot of moving parts. Yes. So this story just highlights what happens when big government gets in bed with big business. Even politicians and corporations who claim to care about minorities and the little guy just look the other way. I want to thank Isabella for her courage and Paul for shining a spotlight on this issue. And we will see you next time on In the Spotlight. Take care.